The topic today is regulation, and it's always a fascinating topic, especially for us former regulators. And we want to get right into this, right from the outset. Uh, I note that the, uh, the title of this, Regulatory Land of Opportunity or Obstruction, I'll tell you this, I don't know who lives in the land of obstruction, but I'll tell you, it uh, sounds like a dismal place, but I'll tell you who doesn't live there, it's these esteemed panelists, because they are going to guide, they're going to be a leading role in guiding this industry towards that land of opportunity. Now I'm going to start with my fellow former New Jersey regulator, a man whose career spans the history of modern regulation, George Rover. Now. George, as the title of this session indicates, there will be a role for regulators in this brave new world, but how will that role differ from the role that you and I and others have historically played in gaming? And if, will that change? And if so, how? Uh, thanks for the introduction. Never been introduced that way, Michael, so I appreciate that. Great to see everybody. Um, and thanks for having me. So again, in a lot of ways, I don't see it changing. Uh, significantly. I do think later in the panel, we're going to talk about the evolution of regulators, and I think that will occur. But as long as there's gaming, there's going to be regulators. And actually, you know, when you step back and look at it, now being on the other side, obviously advising clients and having to fill out the heavy duty forms is annoying. Having <laughs> to depend on regulators to give us an answer that we don't always agree with, now that I'm on the other <laughs> side, a little annoying. Um, but at the same time, we always have to remember the pluses to regulation, Michael. And I think the key is, is people don't realize, for example, there's been a lot of conversation about s sustainability and growth of the market regarding responsible gaming. Well, if we didn't have regulators and licenses, all of these gaming companies would clearly be much more aggressive in how they treat players, probably in a very uh, negative way. The market, I don't think, would be as sustainable. In addition, by having a regulatory scheme that sometimes is pretty strict, what people don't realize is there's a lot of companies and people that don't even bother trying to get into the industry. And we don't see that. But when I was a regulator, I got many calls. Hey, George, I have this company or I have this person. Here's a little background. Do they have a shot at getting licensed or not? And a lot of times it was like, not happening. Don't waste your time. So we don't see that. But that is one that's of the- That's changed since you've been a consultant, though. They just have to talk to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little bit. They still don't always agree with me, Sarah, unfortunately. And I'll slam the phone down and call them back. And they're like, we haven't changed our mind. But we don't see that in the industry. And that's a hidden value and benefit to having this regulatory structure. Well, bookmark that thought. Chris, write that down. But there are benefits to regulation. We're going to explore that a little further. Now, Susan, you also- former regulator who has since embraced the, we'll say the dark side, but the, the moneyed side, the more lucrative side, whatever, however you want to term it. So the same question. So what's going to be the role of regulators? Now, Susan, by the way, was a leader in Pennsylvania in helping that jurisdiction, a very important jurisdiction, get started and get going. What's going to be the role of regulators that you see in this new world? I agree that the role of the regulator is not going away. And I also agree that you should be happy about that because the role of the regulator is to create that sustainable industry. And without a sustainable industry, we w wouldn't have any reason to be here. <laughs> but the role of the regulator is to protect the integrity of gaming. And that role is going to endure. Let's hope that that role endures. What is changing and what has changed is the world in which the regulator must function and implement that goal to preserve integrity. We have seen an extraordinary expansion in the verticals that the regulator must regulate. We have new companies that are supporting those verticals at all layers of the technology stack. We have a lot of new players who have come into the industry and a lot of players, media, entertainment, sports related <clears throat> entities that aren't used to being regulated. And that puts a burden on the regulator to help them understand what that world is like and how to help them along their learning curve. And we certainly have an explosion of technologies in the regulated space. And all of that expansion has taken place against a backdrop of regulators who have not gotten additional resources for the most part. They are still responsible for the land-based world that they all started with or that a lot of them started with, and they've added all of these additional responsibilities. So the challenge to the regulator, I think, is uh, greater 
than it used to be, but I think that the role of the regulator to protect the integrity of gaming will endure and that the regulator has to find a way to leverage the resources that they have to fulfill that role. Integrity is another word, Chris. Write that one down, too. <laughs> uh, there, is, there, there are themes clearly emerging. We're just getting started, but there are themes emerging here that essentially that if regulators and regulation did not exist, we'd have to invent them because they do play a role. And I'm going to talk to the two bookends on this, uh, on this <laughs> panel right now because, I mean, I'm old enough, maybe the oldest one here, sadly, uh, to remember when the gaming industry, in order to get capital, would have to go to Jimmy Hoffa and the Teamster Central States Pension Fund, uh, not to Wall Street for financing, hmm. for a whole bunch of reasons that regulators, and, and I'm going to say it right up front, regulators in New Jersey in particular, played a key role in addressing. So I'm going to start with, with Sarah at the, at the end here. So from your standpoint, because you're involved now in, in the capital markets with respect to gaming, in your role now. So what role have regulators played and what role should they play in providing confidence yeah. to capital markets? Yeah, I mean, look, I think you're bringing up the, the old days of the, the mafia and, and clearly so much has changed since then. I mean, it's been like 70 years since um, I'm not gaming that old. has been... <laughs> Um, gaming has been legalized and legitimized in the U.S. And, and that was clearly the intent and role of a gaming regulator was to go through licensing process to make sure that the bad guys were staying out of it. And, you know, I worked at the American Gaming Association. A lot of the role that, that I played as the, the spokesperson on behalf of the gaming industry was talking about and dispelling the myths around casino gaming, that this is a totally legit business. It's traded on the stock market. Um, that you know, people go through these very cumbersome regulatory requirements, and so I think those days of, and especially now, you know, part of legalizing sports betting was honestly to mainstream the casino gaming industry and to align ourselves behind something that is so widely embraced and so popular, and it's worked. Um, gaming's not going away; it is a massive part of the economic engine in a lot of local communities. Um, it's continuing to grow which is great. And I think from a Wall Street or a capital markets perspective, you know, they see the power of what is a entertainment option for consumers and certainly the popularity now in sports betting and the rapid pace in which it's been adopted and legalized. Um, you know, I, I think business is open, clearly. I mean, these are multi-billion dollar corporations. And again, that give back to their communities, either through employment, tax contributions, um, and I think, you know, obviously Wall Street wants to be a part of that and play, play a role in that as well. Andrew, uh, you're kind of to a great degree representing the operator market here. So what do you see as the role that regulators play in advancing, let's say, your business agenda? Yeah, I think that that's a great question. I agree with everything that Sarah talked about, about um, how the stability of the market comes from the regulation. You know, you have these very... Uh, strong integrity checks on operators. And I think regulators also play a role. Um, there's an old saying, so I'm not going to take credit for it, of course, uh, where information breeds confidence and silence breeds fear. And if you have regulators who are out there and open and engaging with the industry and, and talking about uh, what their expectations are of the industry and it's, it's fully transparent, it really helps uh, the operators be able to one, comply with the regulations and the intent of the regulations, uh, but also it helps markets understand and, and everybody understand how the state is going to go about this. And I think the, the biggest impact on operators, on markets, on everybody is when there's a shock, when there's something comes out of nowhere and they don't expect it. So I think um, that's probably the biggest part on our business and on anyone looking to invest in the space is, is caring about uh, transparent and information from regulators. I'm already going to mangle that quote, but would you say information is breeds confidence, silence breeds fear. Okay. Uh, so just following up real quickly, uh, Chris, write that down. <laughs> <laughs> um, just following up real quickly, do you see regulators then playing sort of a calming role? Yeah, I do. I mean, I, that's, that would be the hopeful fact for them to, to play that role. I mean, obviously, if there's something untoward going on, they need to get to the bottom of it. They need to solve for that. And if there's an operator doing something they shouldn't be, then that's that's its own issue. But in the day-to-day -day management of the industry, that that they should be able to play a calming role. 
to let everybody know how the, how the, to expect that state to uh, to go about its business. I'm going to ask you one more follow up because okay. you just made a good point here. Is that uh, the other people on in the private side operators? Not Sarah, get ready. You're going to ask you the same question. Uh, operators and so forth on the private side. Do do they share your view as to regulators? What do you see as uh, as the dominant view? Do they say like? Why do we need Maybe I regulars? should take that since he, he actually works for a company. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I feel about? like I was privy to a lot of conversations when I was at the trade association and hearing sort of feedback from CEOs and um, company representatives around their relationship with regulators. And I would say largely, obviously, extremely positive. And I think the, the, the consistent feedback, and if we, we weren't feeling that way with the gaming regulator, was it's a partnership, right? Like, the gaming regulator is invested in the success of the gaming industry. Um, and so I think forging that and having open lines of communication is, is always massively important. Now, sometimes there are very sensitive issues to a, a particular company, right? And so it was always good then that the industry could advocate on specific regulations that were impacting potentially everyone across the board. But I think largely speaking, and again, you, you know, there's a learning curve, right? There has been a massive learning curve as Susan alluded to with um, with online gaming, with new entrants coming into the space now, patience, but also I think partnership is like at the heart of what the industry, I think, keeps in mind. And certainly you guys can speak from a regulator perspective, but that has always been our experience. Now, of course, like I said, one-off incidents, which I'm sure Andrew could talk about, but you know, largely speaking, really, really positive relationships. Well, yeah. right. The the regulator right. and the industry they aren't enemies, and they and they can't uh, view each other as enemies. It works best when they talk to one another, and that's what I try to impart to clients: is that you know, don't be afraid to talk to the regulator. You can best explain your product to them. Don't leave them in the dark, guessing about what it can and can't do. And I think when the the relationship is viewed as non-adversary, there are adversarial moments absolutely but when the relationship is viewed as non-adversary it it helps it's mutually beneficial george follow up on that can that go too far in the other direction maybe too friendly and what are your thoughts well obviously the rules on that what i, what I was initially going to say is if you look at the casino control act in new jersey obviously the new, the new jersey division of gaming enforcement is a law enforcement agency by statute right and we had state police assigned to us and we took our job very seriously. We investigated our own organized crime cases, meaning gaming enforcement investigators. But if you look in the act, it says in the legislative findings, we're also to promote the growth and stability of the industry. It's right in the statute. So it's, you know, the signal there is right, right there in black and white. And so you have a law enforcement agency yet in the legislative creation of the agency, you're supposed to promote the growth of the and stability of the industry. And I think when when I was particularly when I was deputy director, I would tell in the hard cases that came in, I would get the investigators in the room early and say, assume that this person is being licensed. Because the minute you start an investigation thinking that you're going to get to a certain result, you make mistakes. And you personalize a case mm -hmm. and you're sure to screw up in a case. And in the very few cases that happened in New Jersey where there was a bit of a screw up, you could just see they were trying to make the facts fit the result. And so again, I think it's that approach should be, we're here to get people licensed. Now, obviously you can go too far, which is coming back to your point. Yeah. And you can't be too friendly in a, in, a, in a ethical way. You can't, how you conduct yourself with someone. But I, I think, you can't be too pro-business. You should always try and make it work for whoever's applying for a license. That's a, it's an interesting point, a good point. And the, the same principles, that precisely the same thing that George just pointed out, from a, a land-based perspective, not a single iota of that changes in, in the digital world. It now, should. Now, Andrew, knowing that regulators have law enforcement powers, handcuffs, and they can pull out your personal history disclosure form at any moment if they don't like what you, what you say here. So I want you to tell us what you think. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I think that that's exactly right. When you're talking about the, the relationship, it has to be uh, working together. It, it, the, the, the states, and every, even from the beginning, from when a bill passes and you start to look at how you're going to develop the regulations, uh, 
the states that have had, I think, some of the, the most difficulties, or at least we've had some of the most difficulties in, are the states that haven't embraced engaging with their stakeholders. I mean, states like Colorado, Arizona, and Ohio have all had great uh, interaction with stakeholders from the very beginning of, you know, having either public comment uh, sessions where they've had multiple calls and discussions with stakeholders over the draft regulations um, or multiple drafts of different uh, sets of regulations like Ohio has been doing. Like, I think that that has kind of served a very strong and good purpose. Um, and other states have been very good about relating with with uh, industry members as well. But I think that, that this kind of set us a good standard for going forward is actually have it from the very beginning to understand that the products and, and what we need and what they need. So, I mean, I'm not going to sugarcoat this. I mean, I think where we are in 2022, I'm not convinced that every state and every operator and every regulator just coming in fully understands the necessary role of regulation and the necessary history. And I, I find it worrisome that they don't. And I hope, they, hope they're attending sessions like this to kind of understand that, that perspective. But I'm going to look at the, the brave new world of gaming. Now, now Susan... Uh, iGaming is now just about a decade old. Uh, and let's put some hindsight to that. From, from your standpoint, um, is it better to be a pioneer? Look at, at New Jersey is and was uh, in both iGaming and in sports betting. In other words, is it better, everyone else get ready for this, the same question's coming up. Is it better to say, we want to be first, or is it better to say, listen, uh, be my guest, you go first, and after you. I think there are pros and cons to being first. You know, the pro is that you have blank slate and you're free from the influence of precedent. And the con is that you have a blank slate and you're free from the influence of precedent. <laughs> uh, uh, in Pennsylvania, we were an early adopter of iGaming and sports wagering, but New Jersey had come first, and I think it was a luxury that we were able to not be first. We were certainly able to learn from the experiences of New Jersey and even Delaware, we talked to about their iGaming experience. And there are lessons that can be built upon as a result of coming not first. But no matter where you come in the fold, you could be 15th or second or 40th, the reality of being a regulator is that you don't know what you don't know and that there are going to be experiences that you're going to have to cut your teeth on and learn yourself. So I think it was a luxury to not be first, uh, but you know, I, I think that, uh, that anywhere along the way, uh, a regulator is going to have to adopt and evolve as they gain their own experience with the new vertical. So, in part, so as not to make the mistakes that may have been made by being a, from having been a pioneer. Um, Sarah, your thoughts on that? Uh, I mean, Susan said it so well. I don't know that I can add much more other than to say, like, I think, you know, from a leadership perspective, especially New Jersey and what's the program called? New Jersey First or New, New Jersey? Jersey First. Yeah. So uh, amazing, tremendous leadership is required, certainly from a gaming regulatory perspective in, a, in an area in which that is so highly regulated. There is, there's a lot of risk you know, sort of fraught with sometimes gaming and perception around gaming. And so I applaud gaming regulators, not just the ones in New Jersey, but across the board then that are willing to take new innovative approaches to how things maybe had been done, or now you're in a new space, as Susan said, like you're creating your own environment. And I think that constant line of communication, again, with the operators is so critical because they do see so many things that regulars, it, it's not ill intended necessarily, but it just, how things may have been written may not be apply, applicable to today. So when you talk about iGaming regulatory statute that was written, what, 10 years ago, I mean, so much has changed, so much has advanced. Um, it, regulation can become a, a blessing and a curse. So again, the role of the regulator and staff is so important that they really do truly understand how to move up an industry forward so we can continue to compete. And also, one of the issues with respect to being first is that, in many ways, there's no do-overs in regulation. There's no no mulligans necessarily. At George, you, let's let's give this some New Jersey flavor. Right. You referenced earlier the New Jersey Casino Control Act. Sure. The preamble to the New Jersey Casino Control Act says that uh, gaming is is been authorized and regulated in New Jersey for the benefit of I get the exact words, but of 
rebuilding Atlantic City as a tourist destination, as whatever it was, whatever it was called back, way back in the day. Yep. Um, that's the preamble to the statute. That same statute uh, authorized was, is where iGaming and sports betting and everything comes from. Uh, and they didn't change that preamble. And yet, one of the things, and, and tell me your, your thoughts as a former New Jersey regulator, because one of the things that emanated from that, that statute is that once you had skins and, and so forth coming out, that I forget who, which entity it was, but we ran television commercials in North Jersey saying, don't come to Atlantic City, deal with the traffic. Here's Atlantic City right here. That's not exactly the way you rebuild Atlantic City as a tourism destination. And I'm wondering if things like authorizing skins and so forth, were they the right things to do? Uh, should there have been some second thoughts? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I'm not a politician, fortunately. So they make the decisions and we have to do what they say to a certain extent, correct? Um, listen, I think you can make an argument on both sides. I, I do think in New Jersey, um, it wasn't in, in the iGaming Act. We decided, meaning the agency decided to have five skins for casino and three for sports. To this day, I probably couldn't tell you exactly how we came to those numbers. Um, in, the, in the sports betting statute, it's listed in the statute, three skins. Um, but my point is, if you talk to every casino, they, they are making a lot of money off of their skins. And so I think it's a pretty hard case to say it was a really bad decision to allow online gaming because, again, the skins and the ongoing revenue that they're receiving in rev share, upfront payments has really paid off well for the bricks and mortar casino. And number two, I think they've learned now to use convergence where they're, they understand now uh, that the iGaming market can be used to drive people to the property and... A Absolutely. lot of people have said, a lot of casino operators have said that they have direct proof that it has benefited visitation at the casino. A good point. And I want to be clear, I'm in no way uh, hinting, suggesting no, I that think I you were trying it. to trap me. <laughs> Only a little bit. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, but, uh, no, but you do make that, that point. But let me ask you just a quick follow-up. What was the, the rationale behind the concept of skins? which has since been adopted in other states. Well, again, I, I think it, it was to allow the properties to benefit directly. So they were, in essence, granted a legal right to allow another entity to engage in gaming where beforehand there was no, obviously, iGaming. It was all Atlantic City. And so you're rewarding the companies that invested in Atlantic City to say, you now can take advantage of these opportunities that have monetary value to help compensate for the fact that People are not always going to have to come to Atlantic City to, to gamble. And I think it makes sense. I mean, Tennessee does not have skins, but they don't have bricks and mortar casinos. Right. Most states realize that we need to reward the bricks and mortar investment, and skins is one way to do that. Your point, I'm assuming part of your point is taking that, don't take wholesale uh, what New Jersey or any other state has done. It's got to be tailored to your state, to your policies what forms of gaming already exist in your state. I agree, and, and I think the other unwritten issue there that has to come up with respect to iGaming is people were playing on the internet with illegal websites. And so the other component of that is we need to bring that revenue into the state. So it wasn't just uh, Atlantic City versus non-Atlantic City. It was all these folks are doing it now. We need to stop them. We need to, them to play in a regulated market. And one thing I just want to build upon on that point is that that is what is so critical and important. And again, I think George made a, a good distinction between sometimes legislation and what's being dictated and directed at you versus regulation. And, you know, at the thrust of what the industry needs to accomplish is really stamping out the illegal market. So in order to do that, in a, illegal operators who have no oversight, no protections, everything else, no ramifications... You know, the regulator, I think, views hopefully their job as to empower then the legal regulated operator to compete then with the illegal offshore markets and, uh, and illegal operators. I think you just gave a really good uh, segue to Andrew here yes. on that point. Yeah, and no, I think that that's, that's a great point. I think it, as, as George and Sarah were talking about, uh, I think there's obviously the benefit of stamping out the illegal market, and that's a state benefit that they want, and obviously we want that too. 
Uh, but I think also from the, uh, the question of how do the properties benefit from multiple skins, if you think about it, um, it's almost any market. Uh, if you talk about clothing markets, you have, and then retail clothing, companies that own multiple different brands across different demographic markets. You talk about the liquor market, you know, Diageo has all these different types of uh, offerings across it because drinkers have different preferences and the same is with betters and, and you have different uh, demographics of different companies. I mean, obviously FanDuel is, tends to, is a sports first business being coming from the fantasy market and from the sports betting market. We also have our iGaming offerings, but we naturally appeal to a sports betting uh, populist, but you also have iGaming providers who appeal to other demographics. So I think that that's where it's both the benefit of stamping out the illegal market, but also helping, helping the properties with multiple skins reach out to multiple different customer demographics. Let me follow up real quick on that, because I think you, we raised a good point here with respect to the illegal market and what you, what you can or can't do about it in a realistic fashion. What can you do about it in a realistic fashion when A, they've at least some of them have a history of paying off bets, mm -hmm. so there's a customer comfort level, and because they're not taxed, they have they can offer better odds. And a, how do you deal with that? How can yeah. a state deal with that? So I think there, while it's limited, I think the the amount that a state can do, there is there still are there's not nothing. Um, the first is obviously creating a competitive mobile market in their state and and allowing consumer choice, which then is able to, you know, be kind of the carrot to draw customers away from the illegal operators. I mean, everybody still at the end of the day wants to make sure that they don't get caught up in anything. Um, you know, a lot of people who might have professional licenses in the state as, you know, doctors, lawyers, whatever, don't ever want to be associated with any sort of illegal activity. But the other part is there are things, you know, Jer New Jersey has done that where with marketing affiliates, you can't, you either market for the illegal market or you market for the legal market, but not the two. So if you want to be part of the legal regulated market for marketing affiliates in New Jersey, you can't go and also have on your site links to offshore illegal books. You're getting some great points here. I want to see people writing things down or whoever, you know, at least taking notes. Richard's typing diligently here. Um, so, Susan, let's, let's follow up on that, because uh, uh, what can a state do, number one, to target the illegal market? And more important, or at least equally important, do you deal with the illegal market by letting them come in from the cold and saying, <laughs> hey, you took these uh, black market, gray market bets, it's okay, we want you on, the, on, the, on this side? Well, that's the approach Ontario has taken, and uh, you know each jurisdiction gets to make those decisions for for themselves, and, or the, uh, it could be legislated whether or not they can make those decisions. How can you encourage people to play on uh, regulated markets versus illegal markets? I think you have to demonstrate to them the benefits of playing on the regulated market. Who are you going to call when you've got a problem and you've got an, you're playing on an illegal site? Uh, no one. And I think if the consumer understands the benefits and the fact that they are, there are protections and regulations and fairness is important to the equation and that it's enforced, that uh, that is a persuasive way to encourage play on the, the regulated markets. George, I think you, I see you chomping at the bit. Of, on the yeah, well, listen, I live this this issue and uh and i know exactly what's going on for example at dge and um again there is there are certain things you can't do as a state agency right you don't have extra t territorial authority or jurisdiction let alone being able to do something overseas so the real fatal blow to the offshore market will have to be done by a federal prosecutor it's just not going to happen um listen new jersey cooperates with federal officials all the time and they, they do have a routine now. They go after affiliates very aggressively. Um, they write probably a dozen cease and desist letters a month at a minimum. And they have a process where if you, want, if you have an offshore company, you want to come to New Jersey and have it bought by a regulated entity, it's permissible. The owner is out. The chief officers and, uh, officers and directors, they're out. Anyone else who was working in the U.S. market or out, but th that asset can be bought by a regulated company, and, and that again is designed to further squeeze um, the illegal market. And I, again, I think it's having steady, 
um, but slow results, but it's definitely shrinking the market slowly. It'll never go away. Squeezing it from the supply side, in other words, I think there's no there's no reward and there may be some punishment. Correct. If you are okay. Well, so that's... again, a, you know, some recent major affiliate company just sold to a regulated New Jersey company for tens of millions of dollars. Are they allowed to profit from that though? Yes. That's the trade off. The trade off is to get that offshore affiliate company out of business. We'll let you sell that, but you're out forever. Your officers and directors are out forever. They can never come in the industry. But we've now removed you from sending customers to these black market companies. Isn't that a little bit different from the rules that apply, let's say, in the land based market, uh, in the sense that I, I don't, you know, don't want to use any names here, but the owner of a casino who was found to be uh, unsuitable was forced could be forced to sell his or her stake. Uh, so you're thinking operate. of that one case a few years ago? Yes. That was a bad decision. It was a 2-1 decision, and I think the dissent in that decision was the right one, which is you had bad actors but not bad assets, right? So if you look at the Arthur Anderson case, really bad decision by the federal government, major accounting firm, they indict the company. Instead of the, they indicted the eight bad actors, but they indicted the company, Guess what? They put the company out of business and 45,000 people worldwide all lost their job. You remember the Arthur Anderson case. So you can remove bad actors, but the asset should be able to survive and be used. Well, one last point, and I'm not trying, I don't want to belabor this, but just for accuracy's sake, is that it, you know, if you put a conservator to take over a, a property, say, the only, and, and just divest those sales and get them to in the hands of a suitable operator, the previous owner who was found unsuitable cannot profit from, in other words, can't yeah. sell it at a profit. Pretty, well, there's other cases I've seen that happen where they've said, no, we just want you out of the industry. You can sell for fair market value. It's an interesting dilemma totally. and a unique, rather unique to gaming. Sarah, I'll let you hear your thoughts on this because you deal with oh, a lot really? of them. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tough one. It's it super tough. tough. One. I mean, uh Honestly, what I was just thinking about was, um, no offense to Andrew, but FanDuel DraftKings, right? Like moving forward during the DFS days and then sort of represent, representing the, the legal regulated industry. And we can go back and forth on that. But um, it's sort of unfair. You're like, well, shoot, I played by the rules and I did everything that everyone was asked, you know, asked me to do as a, as a regulated entity. And all this illegal activity was happening and these people were making tons of money. And now like, all of a sudden you get to come into the marketplace and we were unfairly sort of punished. So I think it's super tough. I think, look, I, I think what George is saying makes it a lot of sense. Um, if you are the person, okay, then maybe you shouldn't be allowed in the marketplace, but it does make sense to say, well, you actually are now going to help eliminate the illegal market by continuing to offer that product or whatever. So it, it's a tough one. And Ontario is a great example too, right? Like huge illegal market. Okay, well, now you have to go get, you know, regulated. But if you're an operator, let's just, I'll pick one, Caesars, who wasn't operating illegally, but now you got to go compete against operators who've been in that space for decades. It's tough. Like, that's really tough. Especially since many of those operators who operate illegally have databases of that's players. That's right. Like, you're flipping the switch now and you already have customers. And, they can then and you, you were operating illegally. So and that's and that's why the New Jersey model is kind of in the middle. Right. They're saying we're not going to let you continue to profit from those assets. They have to be sold to a regulated company. How do you feel as a regulated company who's always played by the rules? How do you feel yes. about that? I, 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 <laughs> I already threw him under the bus. So yes. Yes. No, 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 back over, over him again. I see the time showing zero on the clock. <laughs> no, no, but the, no I, I understand that. I'm not, you know, not going to wade in too deep here. I, well, I, you know, I think I'm not trying to put you on yes. the spot here. I'm, but I think I think it is. Uh, but answer. I think the it's something. Yes, but it still answer the question. But uh, no, I I, I think it's a, just a very tough one. It's going to have to be decided. I think almost on an individualized basis because you have to look at the totality of the circumstances in the case. I mean, there's some that are like absolutely egregious, and then there's others where you say, okay, maybe you've done the right things and you've gone through and replaced leadership and and done all that, and we can move forward. So yeah, when when we allowed Amaya to buy Poker Source Full Tilt. Yep. Obviously, a lot of hate mail came in from the industry <laughs> to DGE, and I, I understood it. I understand completely their position, and a few folks who are still in the <clears throat> industry who are CEOs are still angry about allowing that to happen. And so it's just it was kind of a balancing what's best for the overall industry, and um, 
you know, I think Susan pointed out every jurisdiction has to look at it differently and what works for them. Well, yeah, I mean, you, th you think it's easy being a regulator. Not only do you have to deal with difficult situations, you're underpaid for the privilege. So, <laughs> so Susan, uh, as a former regulator, what advice would you give to the future generations of regulators as to essentially uh, uh, what are the lessons that they need to retain and, and how should they go about their jobs going forward? Don't uh, try to create the, the, the wheel yourself. <laughs> you know, look to the experiences of other jurisdictions, talk to the regulators in other jurisdictions, learn from their mistakes, build on their experience, and talk to the industry. When we launched iGaming and when we launched Sports Wagering in Pennsylvania, I invited in a ton of companies to come in and educate the staff on what is this thing called online gaming and how does it work and how is it different and how is it the same? And that is extraordinarily beneficial to the industry to form those relationships with the regulator and to the regulator to be able to understand what it is that they, is coming their way. You know, don't, don't, um, don't be afraid of one another. I think that that's my advice to regulators. Anyone else have any advice to the future generation? No, no, I agree. It's, it's got to be collaborative, and what I have found when I was a regulator is almost any decision you made, even if it was negative to the position of what the casino wanted, if they were part of the conversation, they certainly felt a lot, lot less angry about it because you listened, you explained why you couldn't do it, and they weren't happy, but it was a different level of unhappiness. It, was, it makes a big difference, and you really should be inclusive. Well, I think we've all learned something here, and everyone should read Chris's notes because he's been taking... Uh, scribbling down furiously. So anyway, but please join me in thanking this tremendous panel.